Okay, uh, good afternoon uh, and good evening where you are. It's John Florescu here. I'm here on behalf of Alianza. And uh, tonight we have two guests, Dr. Arafat, Raid Arafat, who's with me here in Bucharest, not of course in the same place, and Dr. Juliana Nicolescu, who is in, uh, in Michigan. By way of background, I think Dr. everybody knows Dr. Arafat, who I would describe as the point man for the COVID uh, effort that's going on here, which is difficult, you know, certainly a difficult task as it is everywhere else. And Dr. Nicolescu, who is uh, one, a former board trustee of Alianza. And secondly, she's head of the Romanian Medical Association of America in Michigan. And I think she's in Detroit, if I'm not mistaken. So welcome all. And um, I wanna say, first of all, that this is being recorded. So, uh, that just for convenience sake, nothing more mysterious than that. And if you have any questions, you can ask questions at the end. Um, I will just uh, turn immediately to Dr. Arafat and ask him to give us a little bit of an overview right now of the situation, uh, because it seems to be heating up all over the world and in Romania. Dr. Arafat, thanks for joining us. Thank you for the invitation. Happy to be with you. So, if, if uh, you may allow me, I will, I will talk a little bit on how things evolved in Romania so that people know what we were doing and what we did here and where we are now. If we remember when it started in end of December, beginning January, we had the first meeting of our group, which we call it the Group for Highly Infectious Diseases, which is under the National Committee for Emergency Situations. This is an advisory group to the National Committee, which works on major emergencies in Romania. And we advised that something is wrong, we need to start taking measures. That was by the end of, of January. And then of course, we started looking at what is happening in the world and started uh, following it up and starting, started preparing ourselves. We found ourselves at that time that we have nothing prepared, though we warned a lot about this issue. Romania was one of the countries which warned uh, last year, after a major uh, tabletop exercise we did during our presidency to the European Council, we, in fact, uh, showed together with, uh, with the Helsinki Hybrid Threat Center in, in Helsinki, which is a NATO EU center, we showed that Europe is not prepared for a pandemic. We didn't know a pandemic is coming, of course. But we mentioned the lack of stockpiles, the lack of PPEs, the lack of many things that we found ourselves lacking when this pandemic started. Then in Romania, we had some warnings as well. But of course, in the political world, when you ask people to pay money just to store things, they think always that this is not worth it. So this way, uh, there was not a lot of reaction. At the EU level, we had a start of a project called RescueU to start stockpiling at the EU level, but still that project was not implemented at the moment when the pandemic started. So Romania faced a major challenge uh, comparably to, in comparison to Bulgaria, to Hungary, and to the other surrounding countries. And that is that we have a huge number of Romanians living outside. And that number mostly is in the two countries which were mostly hit, that is Italy and Spain. So we have a diaspora of hundreds of thousands of Romanians that live in, that, in those two areas. So one of the things that when, when, when we started taking measures, one of the things we were thinking of is what will happen during the Easter vacation, because usually, hundreds of thousands will come to Romania to see their families. So we are very worried about what will happen if they are coming from those areas and they will meet the elderly, they will meet their grandpa, grandma, and so on. And then we may have a huge impact in Romania. So we started sending messages, starting with the president of Romania, the prime minister, myself, and many other colleagues, advising them not to come this year for the Easter vacation. But we saw that these advices were not going anywhere. At the same time, think the first cases appeared in Romania and the first case was a case which was transmitted or imported from Italy by an Italian citizen who came to Romania while he was having fever. 
and he moved in several areas and this is where we had the first Romanian infected people. And slowly the cases started growing and we went into the state of emergency. <laughs> and once we went into the state of emergency, we started implementing rules of dis distancing. And of course, we forced quarantine on those coming from the red zones, as we called them. The quarantine to be 14 days and the quarantine would be either in an institutionalized place or at home but you need to stay for 14 days. And of course, this is where we had maybe the biggest effort that we, 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 we did at that time is to convince people that this is for their own good, either to be quarantined or to be, uh, at home, or if they cannot, then in a certain area which is offered by the state. So that was one issue. The other issue which we faced in Romania is preparing ourselves in a fast way. So we came out with the legislation which allowed us to start creating our strategic stockpiles for the pandemic. And that is not only for this pandemic, for the future as well, which allows us to purchase in an emergency procedure what we needed. But the problem was that we faced what the world was facing and that is that we were completely dependent on the Asian area to buy, to procure our equipment. Nobody could find PPEs, personal protective equipment in Europe. It was very, very hard to find. And the same thing for intensive care equipment. I remember taking the phone and calling the head of one of the major companies in Germany, Draeger, for ventilators, which I knew very well, I know very well. And he told me, it's all booked, he cannot deliver anything. We did the first biddings and we had contracts, for example, with a company from Switzerland, which manufactures ventilators. And just once we finished the bidding and we were going to sign the, the final agreement, they withdrew and they said, no, there is a country which ordered 3000 pieces. We are not going to sign with you anymore. So we went towards companies from South Korea, from China, and it was very, very hard to obtain what we needed. And most of our equipment, we obtained it from South Korea. That is what our department, the emergency situations department did. Whilst the Ministry of Health was working also on their own and they targeted materials from China. And as many countries had as a problem, some of those materials when they were delivered turned out to be non-conform to the regulations and to the standards, and they couldn't be used. So these were issues that we faced. At the same time, we faced a big issue in transporting materials from South Korea or from Turkey, because we bought FFP2 masks from Turkey, and we used the Air Force, and we used also NATO airplanes from the Papa base in Hungary, where Romania has ours, which are assigned to Romania, and we used those to bring the first materials from South Korea and from other areas to Romania as fast as we could. And I would say that the reaction was okay. We didn't have a moment where we were completely out of protective equipment, but we had at the beginning some moments where we had lack in some areas. Now, I would say that we are much better prepared. We have a stockpile, we have materials, we have ventilators in the stockpile. So that would, have, that would help now at this moment. One other thing we faced, and Romania did the same thing, which I think it was a big mistake from everyone who, who did this, was blocking the export and the movement of certain materials to other countries. Yeah. So we found this happening in Europe. We found this happening in many areas where we were announced no more uh, medical equipment to be exported from that country. And Romania did the same thing. So what we woke up that we were doing, in fact, that we blocked the components of certain ventilators which were manufactured of Romania in Romania, but they are not ventilators. They are only components for companies in Switzerland and in Germany. By blocking them in Romania, they would not be able to manufacture the ventilators in those countries. So we had to work on this and to allow the export of these materials and components 
so that they can manufacture the equipment that they were supposed to do. So, okay. uh, sorry, go on. Yeah, so that was the beginning of the situation. Yeah, I mean, so a... the first month. Go on. The first, the first month, I would say, was with the emergency states declared and so on. It was, uh, it it worked on well, I would say. We really succeeded to do things in a in a in a right way, but then. After that, we started seeing that the politics started moving and we started transforming the, the, the COVID fight into a political playground. And I think that that was one of the worst things that could happen. We are not the only country which did that. Many other countries had the same problems and we always raise this problem to politicians that they should leave emergency cases and situations away from, from fights between each other, uh, we never succeed to convince them. So what happened is uh, we started being hit on the legislation. So we had the first attacks on the legislation that we were using for this situation. And we found ourselves that the Constitutional Court was canceling the laws that we were using. And one of the things they canceled was the law which allowed us to find the people who were not respecting the regulations and to give them back their money. So from this moment, we started having problems of uh, credibility in front of the population. And the population was seeing that there are fights, there are fights on the TV, and at the same time that the legislation was being dismantled. And again, this caused us a lot of trouble to keep on the work we started where the population had a high rate of confidence. The rate of confidence started being questioned by the population. Then we had another attack on the legislation and the law on quarantine and isolation was considered also not good. So it took us about two weeks to have another law passed. In those two weeks, we could not control anything. So we had people who were positive and we're going around in the streets and nobody can control this. So this is where the numbers started going up. During the state of emergency, we had an average of 300, 400 cases a day. That was the maximum we had was 523. And slowly this number started going up and the maximum we had until now was two days ago, 1,700 cases in one day. In in the intensive care, we are having between 470, 560 patients. Our capacity for COVID in the intensive care at this moment, the first line, as we would say, and the second line is about 950, 980 beds. They were much less, we increased that number. But again, one of the major problems we are facing is the human resources and the anesthesiologists and the emergency physicians and so on. So the situation now, we had to go on with many activities to take back the activities, like we had restaurants clo closed inside and outside. So we started opening the terraces. Then there was a lot of pressure to open them inside. So we opened them inside 15 days ago. Then there's the school which started. Then there is uh, different activities which started going back uh, under certain control. And now we see an increase in the number of cases and we are waiting to see what will be the impact of going back to the schools and the election period, because now there are the election and there is the election campaign. So we will see what will be the impact of all this within the next 14 days or 20 days. I will stop here and ask me if you want me to add anything. Well, that's very interesting. I want to bring in Dr. Nicolescu. Uh, she's in Michigan. She's been tracking this in the United States. And I, it's a question actually for both of you. Is there a correlation between the number of how many are sick and how many die? I seem to hear in the United States that the number of people who are dying from COVID has been going down as a, as a percentage. But is there a correlation between the two? Dr. Arafat, could you answer that first? And then Dr. Nicolescu from the U.S. perspective. Well, I think that we are seeing now, like in many other countries, an increase in the number of younger people becoming positive, but without going into a critical phase. 
Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, we are seeing now daily in Romania a high number of deaths. We are high number for us. It is because we didn't have these numbers during the beginning of the pandemic, but we have them now, which is maybe 40, 50 per day, 35 per day are passing away. We are talking about elderly mostly. So most of those who are passing away are elderly who have comorbidities. So it's the same thing which happened in New York and happened in other places a few months ago. Interesting. Dr. Niklasko, how about from your perspective? What do you see there? So I think that's a very interesting question. And I've studied a couple of graphs across the world because what we saw here and actually what I see um, in a bunch of places is at the times where the epidemic hits very hard and the numbers increase to you know, Sam, something catastrophic like four thousand uh, cases, new cases a day in a state. That's the moment I think where the hospitals get get flooded, and those are days where the mortality is huge. For this era to see days with hospital-related mortality, or if you were report the number of deaths per number of new cases in a day going above. 10%, 15% for what we consider a viral infection, I think it's huge mortality. And those are the times, again, where the epidemic is at peak. Most of the times it correlates with high um, mortality. And the reasons for that could be multiple. But the interesting thing is that as time went by, for many reasons, which could be that those that are more susceptible know to stay home and be protected, or the fact that we don't see these many new cases a day, we're better able to take care of them, or maybe we know a little bit better our medical treatment for it. So nowadays, the mortality is much smaller re reported to the number of new cases. So, um, but I think the most consistent trend that we see is that okay, overall the mortality is supposed to be something like 2%, maybe less for the general population. Um, in uh, Michigan was a state with higher than average mortality, even now looking back doing an average is something like 6%. It's yeah. huge, it's a huge number. But during the days of the epidemics here in Michigan, in the United States at the hospital I worked, the mortality was higher than 10% for this. So this goes back to me, even if now we're more controlled, the number of daily cases is less and the mortality for today is probably back to 2% for, for something like this. Uh, to me, this goes back and by the way, Romania, I think, is at 4% with mortality. So it's right on par with what we see uh, uh, in the uh, uh, general uh, uh, world of the epidemics. But I think the thing to be avoided at all costs is to go to those catastrophic days where we see 5,000 new cases a day and there's almost no ICU bed left, which is something that we lived here because this is a very good medical system as good as anywhere in the world. And our mortality was very high in those days. And since the medical treatment for this is not very effective up to date, I think it goes back to the importance of confinement and those uh, restrictions that we kind of open up a little bit, we see what the numbers do, then we have to close down a little bit if the numbers goes up, are very justified. And it's difficult to understand it when you're on the outside and you want to go to a restaurant or you have a pastry shop and you haven't been working in six months, or uh, maybe you even want to go visit your parents in Romania, which is an issue that we'll ask Dr. Arafat maybe to, to comment about because some of my friends have asked me about that. But I think it's very important to understand no matter where we are, this is a disease that could achieve high mortality. Sometimes even if you're younger and healthier, we do not have a treatment, a very good treatment for it. We have some options. And it's very important to understand that prevention and as avoiding a spread to huge numbers may be the one thing we can do. And therefore, understanding where a government comes from in terms of imposing those things on us. It's very difficult to, to put up with it on a daily basis, but it's probably been the only thing that protected us and our parents from seeing worse than what we've seen. Dr. Arafat, thank you for that, Yulian. Yeah, if you may allow me just to add one thing. For yeah. the intensive care units, we did something in the last period. We brought 
We built some modular intensive care units outside the hospitals, but which have all the conditions as intensive care. And we also brought mobile intensive care units on large trucks where they can take several patients in them. And we put them near the hospitals in the areas which were overloaded. And we succeeded with this to avoid part of the transfers. On the other side, we had our helicopters ready and we did several transfers from overwhelmed areas to less affected areas to the hospitals which had places. So we did this also. But it was hard because sometimes we were called to do the transfers when the patients were really, really critical. And it's only through transfer we were endangering their life even more but there was no solution for them in that hospital. So these were things that we faced without going to the numbers that uh, Dr. Nicolescu is saying. So imagine if we will go to 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 cases a day, then we will see really the impact on the health sector to become very, very serious and very critical. Right. Um, you were saying, uh, Dr. Arafat, that you uh, found yourself with one arm tied behind your back at the beginning, low supplies of this, low supplies of that, and you're scrambling around the world, you know, to try to get uh, beds and masks and other things. On the matter of the vaccine, everybody's talking about the vaccine. There's, I, think, well, I hear about a hundred different attempts around the world. Um, do you think Romania is equipped? Can Romania afford the vaccine? What will it cost people? And how, when do you think, do you, are you worried about Eli Lilly or Pfizer or whoever it is, the uh, people in Boston getting vaccines to Romania? Well, once there will be a vaccine, Romania will get it together with the EU member states because we are part of a scheme to procure vaccines altogether. So the first doses will come, will be divided accordingly with the percentage of the population in each country and so on. So I'm not worried that we will get a vaccine once it is there. Yeah. But we don't know when it will be there. So from this point of view, the vaccine issue is something which we really wish to have, but we are still waiting to see when it will happen and when we will have a safe vaccine that we can uh, deliver and we can spread everywhere. So I think that this is an issue we need to think of as a very, very nice thing to have, but we cannot build our hopes on it at this moment. We still need to prevent and to be prepared to face the worst of it if the vaccine is not here or even when the vaccine starts arriving because we will not be able to vaccinate the 60, 70 percent of the population or 50 percent of the population in a very short time. But at the same time, what we are advising now the population to do is to get vaccinated for the seasonal flu. So mm -hmm. we are advising, we doubled the doses this year and we are encouraging the population to accept to be vaccinated against the seasonal flu until we will have a safe vaccine for the SARS-CoV-2. Okay, and so short of the vaccine, in terms of treatments, and Dr. Nicolescu just referred to this, there are some treatments out there that are reducing those people who are both critically ill as well as those people who have moderate symptoms. I just read about, I think Eli Lilly found, has come up with something. Has that changed the picture very much, that these different treatments, um, some of them controversial, uh, have they been successful in reducing the burden that falls on your shoulders and the Romanian medical community? Uh, I'm, I'm not able to answer you now. I think we will need someone from my colleagues from the infectious disease unit or from the intensive care to come and say what they feel about the use of the remdesivir or the other treatments that they started with. But you've seen here, the, all the world started with certain treatments. Then they said, no, this should be abandoned. We should go to that or that or that. Now the remdesivir, we got a limited number of doses. I know that they use them, but I don't know the impact really what it is. I think this is something to discuss with one of the doctors who's working clinically with the patients and who can say more about this than myself. Dr. Nicolescu, how about you? How do you, uh, how do you view those? We read about them. They s seem to be, it's become very politicized, obviously, just like the situation in Romania has become highly politicized. And in fact, I, I, it's probably made the job more difficult. But as far as those treatments, is that significantly improving? It's more difficult to die of COVID now in the United States because of it. Is that the case? 
I think in general, it's more difficult to die of COVID now everywhere in the world. But I think those are rather issues of the very frail people not being exposed anymore. I think from the treatment, so we're using steroids once somebody's on oxygen, there is basically two things that are used all over the world who have some data to, to say that, yes, this improves mortality for the steroids, which are pretty cheap. So I don't think that would be a problem anywhere in the world. And the second one is an antiviral, the remdesivir, which was initially developed for the Ebola virus. But I have to say that in my opinion, the numbers for the remdesivir, I mean, the major study says that there is um, a little bit of shortening of the duration of stay in the hospital, but the fact that it may actually improve mortality is not very well proven. It may be true for a subcategory of patients. So, so this tells you that it's not a miracle drug. So, you know, and that's the more expensive, more difficult to get if you want. Other than that, there is experimental things that we don't have any uh, proof that this is really going to have a big impact. So really COVID right now in the world doesn't have a sophisticated uh, uh, expense, a uh, very expensive uh, medicine that you should be able to get that would save your life, that it's really a matter of um, people who tend to be very susceptible develop very bad forms. And sometimes we don't even understand exactly why. And which is why I go back to my motto that prevention is key here. Yes. I mean, one of the strategies that uh, you were referring Interestingly, Dr. Arafat, I guess it reflects your, your knowledge about logistics and moving people around who are sick and so forth. It goes, ties into your background. Uh, but one of the uh, things that are discussed more and more are not national efforts, by, but regional efforts, efforts, localizing efforts. I mean, in Paris and France, you have France and Marseille and Nice that are Paris and France and Marseille that are, are spiking. Do you think this approach that seems to be the new thing among politicians or among, you know, people that run the medical prevention thing to localize the, so rather than talking about Czech, we talk about Prague, rather, rather than talking about France, we talk about this city, that city. Do you well, think that makes sense? We started doing this and yeah. we are working in this logic at this time. So if there will be a lockdown, it will not be the whole country. It will be maybe a yeah. certain area of the country. Uh, or a certain small town or small, small area where we see a community spread that we need to stop and we need to limit the spread and to take preventive measures. I think one of the major problems which we faced legally and from all the points of view, and I'm sure our colleagues in the States faced the same thing, is the difference between the individual rights and the community rights. And here, uh, the question is, as an individual, do you have the right to infect others by refusing to abide by certain rules when you are yourself infected or suspected to be infected. Yeah. And here in Romania, that was one of the major discussions. And when we locked down for 14 days, certain villages and so on, the mayors went against us to the court and some of them, they won the case, but it was okay because they won it after the 14 days. So the idea is that the measure went on, but at the end, somebody said that the measure was not good, though the measure was suggested by the health department, by the National Institute of Health, and we issued the order only based on their analysis. It was not something which was done from top, just let's do this here or there. It was all done based on the work of health departments, county health departments, and so on. So the difficulty for us in taking measures at this time is that everyone, at least on the political side, will try to fight them. And yeah. still, still, it doesn't mean we will not take them. And fighting them is because of the big discussions we had on certain TV channels and the attacks we have on the social media. And I would say here the word of hybrid attacks and attacks coming even from outside Romania using fake accounts and so on, which tried to convince and they successfully succeeded to convince some people that the right of the individual is more important than the prevention of not to infect the neighbors and the others in the community. And that was something which we insisted on 
and we looked at the legislation in other countries like in Finland, in the UK, the legislation is very strong there on this issue. In Romania, this, is, this was one of the issues why the legislation was declared that it is not good and now even we went into the new legislation with very cumbersome procedure to put someone into a quarantine when they are infected. Still, even with this, we are facing problems because what they request from us is to prove uh, beyond doubt and without any doubt and so on from, from the legal point of view that the medical decision is right. So mm -hmm. it's very hard sometimes to convince a judge which has no medical background that your decision from the medical side is right because the judge is looking maybe at the individual liberty of the person and not necessarily at the community uh, benefit. So from this point of view, I agree that, yes, we are going towards localized lockdowns, localized measures, not national measures, and to follow up the situation in cities and in small areas, and we do this. But at the same time, taking these measures is not easy because of the legal issues and because of the, I would say, the political legal issues which are happening, especially being in a campaign, an electorate campaign now, some mayors believe that if they go against the government to the court and they say they quarantined us uh, in an unfair way, this way they will get more votes from their population. And yeah. this is what is happening at this moment. And I think, I hope we will pass over this because we expect that October, November will not be easy months for us and we may have to take such measures in the future. Yeah. Dr. Nick, let's go. How about you? You know, you said the 6% in Michigan, which was high. And now we see that the pandemic's gone essentially from, you know, New York and the hot zones off to California and then into certain areas that were very quiet, like the Southwest. How do you see it in the States? So I think that we are, other than the areas that are still hot, like California, Florida, um, here, we, we seem to be in a controlled phase. I mean, we did go up some after there was some opening of outside restaurants and gyms and so forth. We're at 700 new cases a day. Uh, however, the proportional death rate is much less. Uh, I think it's something like 40 uh, a day. So we're not seeing, again, it seems to be controlled in terms of new number of cases. Hospitals all have dedicated COVID units. Um, um, and we're not in a, in a period where we see things ramping up out of control. Um, situation seems to be still uh, uh, quite acute uh, in states like uh, Florida and California that still see huge daily numbers and higher mortality associated with those. Um, and uh, for I don't know if it would be safe to say that the cases tend to be milder than what they used to be. It's not really a scientific uh, proven um, statement. Uh, it's more of a what we think we see, but that could also be because pa patients that are more susceptible are like the elderly or the sicker with comorbidities know to just stay home and protect themselves after what we uh, we saw. But again, I don't see uh, coming out of this uh, mode of confinement anytime soon because the vaccine, when even when it's going to be here, uh, we're not going to be able to immunize 60% uh, of the population for uh, various reasons. So. The other uh, option would be that we do come up with a more effective treatment. There is always hope for that. Um, and uh, like my husband says, uh, the, the virus doesn't like to kill the host. So maybe it's just gonna, <laughs> maybe it's just gonna decide to be less uh, uh, furious and uh, you know, in, in terms of uh, 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 favorizing its own survival, it's gonna decide to take a minor, minor course for the future. But those are things that we don't really know right now. Well, you seem to be on the same page there, that localization seems to be the better thing. The other trend that one spots is that governments that have a hard hand seem to have controlled it more quickly, notably China. So China seemed to jump on it you know, relatively fast. We don't know exactly when the beginning was, I guess, but their, their, their number of cases, certainly given their population, you know, something to admire. I noticed Israel's contemplating, I think, a second lockdown. Do you think um, you're not economists, so you're not worried about the economy necessarily. You're medical people. 
do you think a stronger hand even by local government is something that we'd, would, would be sem sensible? Dr. Arafat. Well, there is a say which says, if you don't sort out the biology, you will not sort out the economy. Yeah. Because, because what we have seen is when we started taking measures, uh, when we started taking certain activities back, Romania, by the way, never had a full lockdown. We allowed yeah. businesses to go on, except for certain businesses, which were risky for the spread of the, of the virus. So maybe restaurants, maybe cinemas, maybe theaters, but building sites and many other activities, they went on even during the lockdown and people were allowed to go to work and come back, but there were no other activities to go to. So from this point of view, I think that uh, taking measures early and in the right way and in a balanced way helps more to stop the spread than if you leave things just, you know, let's see what happens, you know. Yes, then you lose control. And I think that this is where you need the courage to, to, and, and the knowledge to find the balance between what, when you need to lock down for how much and when you need to let things go on and, and the economy to recover. But if we keep saying that the economy is more important at a certain time, what we will have is what we've seen in Romania, a factory which opened after they were shut because they decided to shut when they opened in two weeks time, it was shut down again because a lot of people there, they started having the, the, the uh, SARS-CoV-2 test positive. And then we discovered that that was because of the transport because they used their own buses and in the buses, they were not having any kind of protection. There were too many people in the buses and they were traveling for 30 minutes, 45 minutes. So this is how they built uh, a group of infected people in the factory. They had to shut down for 14 days. So I think that, uh, yes, there are moments where you need to have uh, a firm and hard implementation of certain measures, locally, not necessarily nationally, but you need to have a firm decision on taking, on taking these measures. Otherwise, it may be too late within two or three weeks, and then you will start regretting it when you see your health system falling down or falling apart because of the pressure on it. Now we are, we are in the school season, both in both the United States and in Romania. And I would say I have children in school in the United States. Uh, it seems to be a very uh, cloudy picture. I'm talking about university. I'm talking about schools. I'm talking about city schools like in New York or out in the suburbs. And in Romania, you hear the same sort of uneasy comments about green, yellow, and red schools, and are we on, are we off? Um, what's your feeling, um, uh, we'll go, go to you, Dr. Nicolescu, let's take Michigan, you're outside of Detroit, what's going on there, and then we'll go to Romania. So most of the schools here are on online, except maybe just a few. Um, my son goes to one of those that really strive to maintain in-person teaching, um, and they started that way. But we know that a, another cousin school that started um, in-person just closed because they had a lot of COVID uh, cases. Most of the schools are online. Of course, as a parent, none of us is in love with online teaching. I'm a teacher myself, and I know my interaction with students online, is, it, was like, it was half of the lecture of what I would usually do. I mean, there is no way you can relate, talk to people, communicate uh, in an online lecture. But I think just like the economical aspect, this is something that will have to wait its time because nothing dramatic is going to happen to our kids in a year. They're still going to be there. We would rather their parents and their grandparents at home be healthy and wait our time, you know, when we could do again in-person education. I think it's just going to have to to wait. It seems most of the world is online from what I see. Yeah, Dr. Arafat. Yeah, in Romania, we just started. We have three scenarios. We have schools which decided to open person to person that is face to face, as we say, that's uh, on site. There are schools which adopted a high
exactly just the okay. way they will do it. And then we have the health department and the, the education department in that area, which will suggest this for the final decision to the county committee on emergency situations, which is under the governor. But at, at the end, it's the school which decides what's happening. The idea is that at this moment, as I said, we have three scenarios. We are just at the beginning. And I think that we may see what uh, Dr. Nicolescu was, say, was uh, saying, an increase in the number of cases. The rule is that if you have one case in one class or two cases in one class, you shut down that class. If you have three cases in three different classes, you shut down the school for 14 days. So we still didn't go into this scenario. It's just since two days, but I'm sure we will see a dynamic in, in this way. The universities will start and the universities, a lot of them decided to go online, but of course there are some practical workshops that cannot work online and then they have to go uh, for the practical workshops in person. And here I want to ask Dr. Nicolescu, because this is one of our problems now and the university of med the, the medical universities are thinking, what do you do with the medical students in the hospitals? Because this is a question here, if, because the practice happens in the hospitals, especially in the fourth, fifth and sixth year. So this is a number of students which go, which go to patients, to the patient rounds and so on. How do you deal with this in the States? Because it's very unclear on how it will go in October when they will start in Romania. So, yeah, our students have been back on the floors since last month. So during the COVID epidemic, they all stayed home, uh, but we brought them back into the hospitals uh, once the epidemic was quote unquote under control. They do not go in to see COVID patients because the COVID units are separate from the rest of the <clears> hospital, <throat> then they can avoid those floors. Of course, there's always a chance because sometimes a patient with a fever tests negative once and you know you have to retest or the suspicion arises again. So you could never be 100% sure that a student or any of us is not walking into a, a COVID case, but they have been back on the floors. The lectures are still online, but for the uh, rotations, they are back uh, with the patients again on the non-COVID uh, uh, floors. I have to say during the COVID epidemics, the residents uh, have all been working on COVID cases and helped the hospitals, yes. including two of the residents that are Romanian first year, uh, you know, which volunteered to give up their vacation and wanted to go into the ICU right at the beginning of the epidemics. And like a lot of the um, doctors that immigrated from Romania are very, very good and very uh, hardworking to the loss of our medical system back home. So, but that's what we're doing with the students. And I have to say the lack of the training that happened during the COVID epidemic is already noticeable because they're coming in very rusty this fourth years compared to what they used to be, so. Yeah, we used residents as well, but it's the same thing. This is the numbers are low and then they are taking time from their training to work in the COVID units. And this is, this is something which is impacting them, it's true. Yeah. Dr. Arafat, you said a moment ago that if there are three sick kids going into school, that's enough to shut down the school. Does that so mean they three, have- Three sick kids from three different classes. Oh, I see, but COVID sick. Yes, COVID so, sick. COVID sick, so okay. So we have three positive cases from three separate <laughs> classes that is three separate rooms, as we say, where yeah. the pupils are, are participating, then the school closes. If the three kids are in one classroom, in one room, uh, come from a certain group, then it is only that class which closes. Yeah, I see. With the, right now we have a ban on travel. EU citizens can't go to the United States and US citizens cannot travel to Europe. And we have a lot of people like Dr. Nikleska was saying, would like to go see their relatives, see them and so forth. Based on what you know, and based on the numbers that we're seeing, do you see that situation changing anytime soon, one way or the other? Well, in Europe, there are discussions now to have common measures, that is to have the same measures applied everywhere. But this discussion is not going easily. So we are waiting to see 
what will be the decision. Because, you know, even inside Europe, we have countries who shut down completely their borders, and we have countries which don't take any measures, and we have countries which are targeting the citizens coming from countries with high incidence, like Romania, is being uh, uh, under uh, quarantine regulations in Belgium, in yeah. Denmark, in, in Germany, for certain areas. So I think that this game, let's say, of quarantining people coming, it will continue. Now, what will be its rules? We will see. Some countries say if you have a test when you come and it is negative, it's okay. But the others are saying, okay, it's okay for the moment you did the test, but how do we know that you don't become positive a few days later? So from this point of view, I think that we will not finish with quarantining in the next period. If there will be a general rule in Europe, Romania will apply it. So we will not go on our own rules and we will apply the general rule of the EU. But at this moment, there is no general rule in the EU for what, what regulations regarding the states the regulation now is that if you come from there, you go into quarantine for 14 days. So if you come to visit someone, that means you will stay with them for 14 days without you or them going out of the, uh, out of the house. So is, this that is, the rule. is that enforced? Do you have manpower to check that people are kept in quarantine? The police does that, yes. And we have a lot of people who, who got fines because of that even uh, now, even after the issues with the Constitutional Court, there are still fines that are given and there are still regulations which are applied. So yes, there is an enforcement by the police, by the gendarmerie, by the local police. They go, they knock on the door once every two days or once a day. There are areas which, which they could do it even once a day. I'm not sure that every city does it really the same way. But yes, there is a mechanism to control and there is a database of those who are under quarantine or under isolation. Because isolation, it means you are positive and you are staying home for 14 days. Quarantine, it means that you are not positive, but you are a contact and you are staying home for 14 days. When you are battling uh, this uh, uh, epidemic, do you feel like you're battling as a Romanian or as a European? I mean, like in the States, we've got a lot of conflict between the federal government, they're trying to do certain things, and the governors around the United States that have, uh, you know, primary authority really in dealing with the health situation. How about you? Do you feel like this job is, this is kind of a Romanian job, or do you feel that you depend uh, significantly on the insights and the input of, the, of uh, Brussels? No, let's say it like this. Uh, if we apply rules in Romania alone, and we don't discuss with Brussels and we don't look at the European insight on this, it yeah. means that Romania is isolating itself and you cannot work anymore with the rest of the countries. We are part of, the, of an entity. So right. imagine, for example, in the States, one state to decide to take some measures which are completely different than the neighboring state and the neighboring state to take measures very different from the neighboring state to it, this will be a problem then. So in Romania, I think, yes, the measures we take are uh, from the point of view of the Romanian interest. But of course, we look at the EU approach. And usually, if you see the European countries, mostly the measures we applied are not very different from the measures other EU countries applied. Maybe the moment we implemented certain measures were different, was different. Some measures we applied them before others. Some measures we applied them after others. But if you look at the chronology of implementing, implementing certain measures, you yeah. will see that Romania and other EU member states, we were really on the same track in implementing those measures. Dr. Julia, uh, Dr. Nicolescu, your thought on this? So um, I have to say that, of course, it's hard for me to, to look and see if Romania fought this alone or as a European country not being there. But I have to say that in terms of the data that's coming out, Romania seems to be right on with what we see all over the world with the number of tests, for example, reported to the number of uh, new cases per day. We're testing about 20,000 a day for 1,000 new cases a day, which gives us a positive ratio about 10%, which is good because they don't want to see, there are countries that have a positive testing uh, percentage of 
50% or even 100%, which unfortunately means they only test the very sick that made it to the hospital, while we seem to have a screening policy that's wide enough to kind of go out in the community to try and find those cases. So, um, and again, other than that, it's difficult for me to comment exactly on the, the Romania to Europe uh, integration since I haven't been there in a while. But I have a question to Dr. Arfa that I think other friends of mine that live here would have. What if one parent who is alone in the country gets sick and ends up in the hospital? Because that's our problem, right? We live away and uh, sometimes there's nobody left home with the older parents. Is there any kind of emergency situation where we're allowed back in? Or I don't know if there's, I know there's the private hospital system that I'm not very familiar with, but you yeah. know, I'm sure a lot of us will have that concern. We are here. We cannot go there. What if the parents, we have, don't have brothers or sisters, the parents get sick? What do we do? That's a very good question. Well, let's take it like this. First, the private hospitals don't take COVID cases. So the, the COVID cases are nearly 95% or something like this, with some very few exceptions, are all in public hospitals. So that's point one. Point two, even if you come to the country, normally those hospitals are beyond, uh, they will not allow visitors inside. So, you know, because of the COVID situation, the hospital itself is under quarantine when it is a COVID hospital, as we say, because there were hospitals assigned initially to become just for, for those cases. So from this point of view, again, it may be hard to visit, but if you are a physician, a doctor, and so on, it may be easier. The third thing is, uh, until about one month and a half ago, the decision to give exemptions from quarantine was in the hands of the Department for Emergency Situations. So we have a coordination, a national coordination center, and I used to sign these things based on the recommendations of the group, which is working from Minister of Health, Public Health Institute and so on. And we used to give exemptions in cases like the ones you are seeing. Now, by a decision that was taken to make things easier, I don't know if it became easier this way, uh, these exemptions now are signed by the health departments of each county. So that means you have to go to the health department in a certain county and get the exemption from being quarantined and so on. And it depends on that health department if it will give the exemption or not. So there is no clear rule. The only rule which is applicable generally is that if you are coming for business, if you are coming for uh, work, if you are coming in a professional uh, quality, then you are exempted from the 14 days quarantine. I see. Uh, we have a question that just came in. We have a few minutes left. Uh, one was, is Romania working on a vaccine? Sorry? Is Romania itself, any of the institutes in Romania, working on a vaccine right now? As far as I know, there was an attempt in Timisoara. I don't know to which level it arrived, but there was, a, a, let's say, a shy attempt in Timisoara to do something there. I'm not yeah. aware of any other attempts to manufacture vaccines in Romania. Yeah. Hearing you out over the last hour, Dr. Arafat, you get the feeling that, well, you've certainly been down this road a long way with ups and downs. And I get the feeling almost you spend as much time dealing with the politics of it as dealing with the virus itself. Do you have any feelings of the should have, would have, any regrets or what you might have done differently that's changing how you're going to operate in the future? Well, uh, if I would say no, I will be a liar. Because all of us, when we work on new things and on new situations, we all look, we all look back and we all would say, yes, we should have done this or that in a better way. This is why in our mechanism, because for those who don't know me, what I'm doing, I'm, I'm dealing with the civil protection and with the emergency medical response in Romania. This is the, what our department does. So we are responsible for pre-hospital, for emergency departments in the hospitals for their activity, as well as fire and rescue, air rescue, and all this. So now we are gathering what we call the identified lessons. So there is a group of lessons that we are gathering that then 
they should be transformed into learned lessons, lessons learned, as we say. So yeah. yes, from this situation, we are gathering a lot of info and a lot of things that in the future we may uh, try to, to change things to make ourselves better or more resilient, as we say. But again, uh, no one would say that we were perfect. No one would say that we are the best because I think anywhere in the world you would go, someone will be saying, we could have done this maybe a little bit different or a little bit better. Yes, I would say we should have been much better prepared for such situations because we all knew, at least in our field, we all knew that at any time we could face such a situation. And we were talking about this in the last one, two years. We heard a lot of people talking about this. And I think that this is a, lear a lesson which will be learned by many, many people. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Nicolescu, do you have any other questions for Dr. Arafat? Just as you said a moment ago, a very good question, a personal one, because we're dealing with people who want to go home and see possibly dying relatives. How, anything else on your plate? Yeah, I'm curious to know when we're talking about being difficult to find the physicians to work in the COVID units. Um, majority of the physicians in Romania are hired by the health department. Is there, so I understand there are hospitals, there are dedicated to be COVID hospitals, therefore the physicians working there automatically have to work in a COVID environment, but is there, and I'm sure we've seen this all over the world, but is there a reluctance of physicians to go work in the COVID uh, hospitals? Is, there, is it mandated that for everybody to rotate? Yes. Um, it's and a I know very it's good not question. an easy question, but- No, I'm no, no, just, it's yeah. excellent. First, just to correct, no, the doctors are not all hired by the health department. Even in the public hospital, you are hired by your hospital. So it's like in the States, you are hired by the hospital you are working in. The difference is that if you are working in the emergency system, that is the emergency department or the pre-hospital care system, the fire service or the ambulance service, and the fire, of course, running the smooth service, the, the medical side of it, uh, then uh, your money comes from the state budget. If you are on the intensive care unit, if you are an internal medicine physician and so on, your money is coming from the insurance. So we fund the emergency care system from the state budget, not from the insurance, because we care for anyone even if, even if they are not insured. So normally we don't put the insurance into the emergency care, at least the first phase of it. So if, uh, if we would talk about uh, Romania, Yes, we had reluctancy. We had doctors reluctant, and we had doctors who were very much volunteering to go and work where they were needed. Now, this is a situation which goes for a long time. So there is a difference between the beginning and now, because it's a long-term issue. So even if a doctor wants to go and work somewhere, maybe the manager of the hospital doesn't want them to go to work somewhere in the COVID hospital because they want them in their hospital. So we have a means where we can, what we call temporarily transfer doctors to other hospitals to work there by uh, demand or by order, let's say it. And this is, leg this is by law. So we can sign a letter to the doctor and to the hospital and say, starting that date, that doctor will be working in that hospital. They get more payment. They get 50% on their salary and so on, which now the salaries are not so low as they used to be before. They are very similar to other European countries, even maybe higher than some of the European countries. So they get 50% more they get the housing, everything where we are sending them for the 30 days. Usually it takes for 30 days, this thing. And then they go back to the hospital and we take other doctors and move them. This was not very popular, of course. You can imagine. And the person who signs the papers is not popular at all with this. That's myself. So when, when, uh, when you are saying to a doctor, you have to go and help in that other hospital, not everybody is happy, but we cannot generalize. Still, Romania, on the other hand, sent a medical team to Italy and worked there for 17 days 
and it was very easy to find volunteers for that. We sent the medical team to Moldova and they worked there for 14 days. And that was easy also to find together with the military and the civilians, we sent the medical team to, to Moldova. So from this point of view, it is like in every other country, I think. There is a group of doctors reluctant to go and work with COVID patients. There is a group which is happy to do it and they are volunteering. And there is a group which if you ask them to do it, they will not say no, but they will not volunteer themselves from the beginning. So this is what is happening. Yeah. Um, that's an interesting answer. I suppose it's a similar answer in the United States. We are on the hour, so I know everybody's uh, got to move on, particularly given the task of all your jobs. Uh, Dr. Nicholas, thank you very much for giving the uh, uh, U.S. perspective on it. And uh, I don't know if you can hear me, there's some talking going on. And uh, Dr. Arafat, I thank you very much. I, I have heard nothing but good things about your work in a, in a, in a nation that doesn't, isn't really famous for uh, giving a lot of compliments on public officials. Famous for that. Let me say it's a teamwork. I can tell you we are a very big team working on this. Good, terrific. Well, listen, I wish you well in, with the job ahead. Dr. Nicolescu, thank you very thank much. You. And thanks for Alianza for supporting this, uh, this, this call. Thank bye -bye. you, John. Bye, everyone. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Bye-bye.